Good morning. My name is Taylor Sutton. I serve as one of the pastors here, and it's my privilege today to open God's Word for us. Would you join me uh, first in prayer? Our Father, we give you this time, and we ask that you would have fellowship with us here through your Word, with the help of the Holy Spirit, and through our union with your Son, our Lord. And it's in his name that we pray. Amen. As we often do at the beginning of a new year, we're going to spend a few Sundays considering rhythms of renewal. And by this phrase, rhythms of renewal, we simply mean those practices that God uses to transform us, to make us more and more like Jesus. So think of practices like reading the Bible, praying, having fellowship. This morning, I want to talk to you about a rhythm of renewal that we are actually doing right now. If you've been around our church for some time, you'll have noticed that we give almost half of our gathering to the sermon, to this, this activity we're doing right now. Why? When the Protestant Reformation was uh, exploding across Europe 500 years ago, one of the most significant changes the leaders of that movement made was to elevate the preaching of God's Word to a place of central prominence in Christian worship. Why? What, where did they get that from? Today, many would question the wisdom of making preaching such a prominent aspect of gathered worship. After all, Uh, Communication has changed to become much more visual, much more interactive. Attention spans are getting shorter, and people are more and more resistant to the idea of any kind of authority telling them what they ought to think about some matter or another. So the question would be, is it really strategic for churches to prioritize a, an extended monologue about the Bible. And really, every one of us is confronted with this simple question anytime we hear a sermon, why should we pay attention at all? And what should we expect to happen if we do? This morning, I want to persuade you if possible, that the preaching of God's Word is a vital means of spiritual renewal. The preaching, the proclamation, the announcement of God's Word is a vital, irreplaceable means through which God grows us and changes us. And to make this case, I want to read together from the book of 2 Corinthians. So would you turn there with me? 2 Corinthians chapter 4 is where we'll be looking this morning. You can turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 4, and we will begin in verse 1 and read through verse 15. Second Corinthians 4, verse 1. Therefore, having this ministry by the mercy of God, we do not lose heart, but we have renounced disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. 
But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God, who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shone in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life in you. Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence, for it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So this passage that we just read is one section of a letter. It's a letter that was written from the Apostle Paul to one of the churches that he had founded, the church in the city of Corinth. And what Paul does in a large part of this letter is explain and defend his ministry to them as an apostle. And he does this not so much to defend himself, but really Paul is concerned to protect them, to to help them avoid being taken in by counterfeit versions of Christian ministry. And the way, in in this section that we're in, in chapter 4, the way that he seeks to inoculate them against counterfeit Christian ministry is by giving them a theological framework for the real thing, for genuine Christian ministry. And so as he's doing that, In this chapter, in in this section that we're reading, he focuses in large part on one function, one practice of genuine Christian ministry, which is preaching the Word of God. And what I want to draw your attention to over the next several minutes are four characteristics Four marks of faithful preaching. And as we look at these four characteristics of faithful preaching, I hope to show you how those four characteristics explain why and how preaching is a vital means of spiritual renewal. So, characteristic number one. Faithful preaching is a public announcement of God's Word. Faithful preaching is a public announcement of God's Word. And we see this in verses 1 and 2. Look at at verse 2 in particular. So here's Paul explaining his ministry, and he says, We have renounced 
disgraceful, underhanded ways. We refuse to practice cunning or to tamper with God's Word. But by the open statement of the truth, we would commend ourselves to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So Paul has renounced, he rejects certain kinds of communication. He says here that he rejects, he avoids, he refuses to engage in anything like manipulation or deception, or trickery. But by way of contrast, he says, here's what I do communicate. Here's how I do use my words. Look at it again in verse 2. It's by the open statement of the truth in such a way that he can commend himself to everyone's conscience in the sight of God. So what Paul does in his ministry What he is commending to them as true Christian ministry is openly, publicly declaring the truth of what God has said. He's not trying to coerce people. He's not trying to manipulate them. He's not engaged in a bait and switch tactic. He is honestly, candidly, genuinely declaring the Word of God. Through His words, through His proclamation, He is simply putting the truth of God in front of human consciences in such a way that they are confronted with the truth and authority of what God has said. So this really gets at one of the defining essential qualities of what makes preaching preaching. It is a public announcement or proclamation or declaration of God's Word. Now, there are other ways uh, of engaging with God's Word, and they all have their importance and their function. So, for example, a conversation about the Bible can be illuminating. Uh, A lecture on the Bible can be insightful. Reading the Bible individually can be deeply edifying. But what makes preaching different from all of those other valid, important, necessary modes of Bible engagement is the the way that preaching makes this public announcement declaring God's Word to every human conscience. And there is something in the very nature of God's Word that calls for preaching. Or or if I could put it a different way, preaching is uniquely fitting for the kind of truth God's Word is. You see, God has acted in history, and he has spoken to explain his actions. And so the result of that is there is now news that needs to be declared. On May 8th, 1945, the Germans formally surrendered to the Allies, thus bringing an end to World War II in Europe. The very same day, or later that day in the U.S., there was a headline in the New York Times, all capital letters, the war in Europe is ended, with an exclamation mark. When a historic, world-changing event takes place, the most fitting response is to announce it, to declare it, to tell the world what has happened. And in the same way, God, the creator of the world, has intervened. He has acted. He has done things in history and then spoken through his prophets and his apostles to explain the meaning of what he has done. And it has to get out. It has to be 
announced, declared, proclaimed. And that is what preaching does. So to come back to our our theme of renewal, how does that characteristic of preaching serve or uh, facilitate spiritual renewal? This element of declaring publicly God's Word. Well, here's one way. There are surely others. But this public declaration of the truth of God's Word has the power to reorient us to reality. Preaching has the potential, it has the aim, I would say, to reorient each of us back to what's really true. So if you think back to World War II, even though Germany surrendered formally on May 8th, uh, shots were fired on the Eastern Front as late as May 11th. So at least in some quarters, the announcement was needed that the war was over so that people could align their actions to that broader reality. And it's the same with us as Christians. Again and again, we have to be brought back, reoriented, retuned, realigned to the fact that our God has acted and our God has spoken. If you're a Christian, you already believe that, but have you noticed how over the course of a week you can forget it? You can be preoccupied with more pressing, urgent matters, and the reality, the the life-shaping reality of the God who has acted and spoken, it's not that you disbelieve it, but it starts to fade. It starts to become less and less of an active part of who you are and what you do. And so one of the reasons we gather and hear the Word of God preached is so that this declaration of public truth can reorient us to what's really real. And so here's a really simple implication of that. When you are listening to a sermon and you realize that you have heard this before, don't tune it out. Because it's not just about, have I heard this before? Is this new? Am I learning something that I didn't know yesterday? It's about being redirected, reoriented, letting this declaration face you once again in the right direction. And so instead of asking, have I heard this before? You can ask yourself, is my life actually submitted to the truth of what I'm hearing? Do do I actually live as though I believe what this sermon is declaring? That is a helpful question to ask of any sermon, even if the, the content is regarding uh, things you've heard before. So preaching is a public announcement of God's Word. That's the first characteristic. The second characteristic is this. Faithful preaching displays the glory of Christ. Faithful preaching displays the glory of Christ. And we see this in verses 3 through 6. Let me just read these verses all together. So starting in verse 3, Paul writes, And even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing. In their case, the God of this world has blinded the minds of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. For God who said, let light shine out of darkness, has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of 
of Jesus Christ. So, in these verses, Paul is talking about the gospel. And gospel just means good news. The good news that Paul is referring to here is the good news that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, has died on the cross and been raised from the dead so that everyone who trusts in him can be forgiven and restored to God. That is the message. That is the gospel. That is the good news that Paul is proclaiming. Notice what he says about the gospel in verse 4. That the end of the verse. Look at this last phrase. He refers to the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ. So the gospel, whatever else it's about, verse 4 would say the gospel is about the glory of Christ, the dazzling display of his many perfections. So the gospel is for us. It's good news because we need it, but it's also about Jesus. The gospel is a message about the glory of Jesus. And then notice in verse 5 that this gospel that's about the glory and greatness of Christ, this is what Paul is declaring. Verse 5, look at it with me. For what we proclaim is not ourselves, but Jesus Christ as Lord, with ourselves as your servants for Jesus' sake. So Paul's message is Jesus Christ as Lord, King. And why does he proclaim this? Given the fact of what he said in verse 3, not everybody responds. Not everybody accepts this message. But look at verse 6. Paul proclaims Jesus to everyone because God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So this is what God had done for Paul. Opened his eyes to take in, to apprehend the greatness of the Lord Jesus. And it's what Paul is confident God will continue to do in the lives of the people that he's ministering to. God opens people's eyes, the eyes of their heart, so that when they hear this message of a glorious Savior, it not only makes sense, but it strikes them as beautiful, as glorious. So, all that to say, preaching puts the glory of Jesus on display. Now, this is one of the reasons why Christians and our church, we keep talking about Jesus and the gospel over and over and over again. Now, that wouldn't make so much sense if all the gospel was, was a message about how to be saved. Because if that's all the gospel was, then in theory, you could hear the gospel one time, get saved, and move on. Now, don't misunderstand me. The gospel is a message on how to be saved. But it is also, according to these verses, a unique showcase of the beauty of Jesus. Which means that Christians need to hear it again. And again, we need to be reminded of different aspects of this message, of this glory of Jesus. And I think one of the reasons that we can miss this renewing potential of preaching is we can think about the sermon, about the act of preaching and of listening to preaching purely in cognitive terms. What I mean by that is we can think about listening to a sermon as exclusively an intellectual exercise by which the main thing that's happening is we are absorbing information. Now, preaching is a cognitive exercise. It is 
intellectual. Preaching is aimed at the mind. However, it is also aimed at the heart. Faithful preaching seeks to increase delight and wonder in Jesus. Jonathan Edwards talked about how the human will is always inclining towards things or inclining away from things. And, and he referred to the inclination of the will towards God as our affections. And Edwards was convinced that at the very heart of true Christian spirituality was deep and deepening affections for God. And when you have that category in mind, it then makes sense what Paul is talking about here and what I'm inferring from what Paul is saying here, which is simply that preaching aims to stir up our affections for Christ. When, uh, when my wife and I have a chance to go on a date, we often find, to our great relief, that we still like each other. <laughs> we will sit across the table from one another and realize yet again that we do enjoy each other's company. And the reason this can feel like a revelation uh, will be familiar to many of you. As you're working, raising kids, trying desperately to keep up with the laundry, you, you sometimes don't even look at each other. Like, you're just so busy. And so, when you have the chance uh, over dinner or coffee or lunch to just look at your spouse, it's a powerful reminder that you love them. Now, in that situation, I may or may not learn something new about Kira, my wife. If I do, that's great. That also stirs up affection. But just seeing her, really undistractedly seeing her, stirs up love. And Christian preaching is seeking to do something similar for each and every one of us. Preaching, faithful preaching, holds up Jesus to all of us and says, look again at how incredible he is. Look again. See once more the beauty and the greatness and the grandeur and the splendor of Jesus Christ, God and man, crucified, risen, reigning, and returning for sinners. So as you listen to sermons, yes, absorb the information. Take notes. Pay attention. Use your mind. But as you do that, don't forget to also look for the glory. Look for the dazzling beauty of Jesus in the proclamation of the good news that is, in fact, about His glory. So that's the second characteristic of faithful preaching. It displays the glory of Jesus. Third, faithful preaching embodies the truth of God's Word in the humanity of the preacher. Faithful preaching embodies the truth of God's Word in the humanity of the preacher. And we see this vividly in verses 7 through 12. Look at what Paul says in verse 7. Paul says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. So here you see the first way in which preaching embodies truth in the humanity of the preacher. Paul says, we have this treasure, this glorious, Christ-exalting message, and by God's design, this treasure gets carried around in earthen pottery. And the, the purpose, Paul says, is 
so that it will be evident that God's power to save, to do the kind of turning on of the spiritual lights that verse 6 referred to, God's power to save will be seen as His power, not the result of the rhetorical eloquence of any human preacher. So Paul, in verse 7, he looks at his own frailty, his mortality, his weakness, and he realizes it's not so much a liability for preaching, it is God's intended design for preaching. Because God could have, theoretically, uh, preached the gospel to the world through angels, sinless never dying spiritual beings. But in his wisdom, he has decided to evangelize the world through human beings. So that's the first way. But Paul presses into this even more. Look at what he says in verse 10. He catalogs some of the ways in which he's been uh, afflicted, but not to the point of utter defeat. And then he describes it this way in verse 10. Always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. So here is a a closely related way to verse 7 in which Paul embodies the truth of the message that he preaches. He embodies the truth by joining his preaching to his suffering. Paul says, as I go about doing ministry, preaching the gospel, building up churches, evangelizing the lost, I am participating in the death of Jesus. I am carrying it around in my own body so that, he says, the life of Jesus, the resurrection, the renewing power might also be embodied in my body. The point is not that Paul is adding something to the merit or the power of Christ's death. The point, it seems to me, is that Paul adds to his preaching a flesh and blood expression of the death of Jesus. Paul's ministry is cross-shaped down to his very experiences in ministry. So the preaching, faithful preaching of the gospel embodies this eternal, timeless truth in the humanity, even in the suffering of the preacher. And this is why, this is why it's so important to have godly, qualified elders. That protects the integrity of what Paul is describing, that the people who preach and teach and instruct show with their lives the same kind of sacrifice and suffering and love that the message is about. This also helps us see why it's so important to belong to a local church. Belonging to a local church that is healthy and that is protecting a godly, qualified leadership, what all of that does is it makes the vision of verses 7 through 12 possible, where you have people gathered together, the word is being preached, and the people doing the preaching, doing the leading, are are doing so in a way that the message of Jesus is actually embodied in their ministry, in the relational connections that exist in the church by the love and the laying down of their lives that the leadership is exhibiting. Now, it is a wonderful gift that we have so much access to such incredible content on the internet. You can listen to sermons from people who are long dead, You can watch sermons from people who are some of the best communicators in the world. There there is godly, helpful content on platforms like YouTube. These are all good things. But I think if we look at verses 7 through 12, and we look at the vast 
array of options that we have for disembodied Christian content, there's a little bit of a, of a warning, which maybe we could put this way, that it's not good for you to have your biggest spiritual influence be someone who doesn't know you. It's not good for you or for me to have our biggest spiritual influence be someone whom we don't know. The, the, the quality of whose life we have no ability to observe. And so, as we think about the renewing possibilities of preaching, we want to remember that it's not just in the words, it's not just in the preaching moment, it's in the relationship between the preachers of God's Word and the people. God has seen fit to embody the truth of His Word in the humanity of the preacher. That's the third characteristic we see here. So again, the first was that preaching is a public announcement of God's truth. Second, it displays the glory of Christ. We saw third, that it's embodied in the humanity of the preacher. And now fourth, lastly, faithful preaching. Faithful preaching glorifies God by spreading His grace. Faithful preaching glorifies God by spreading His grace. Look at verses 13 through 15. He says, Since we have the same spirit of faith according to what has been written, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we also speak, knowing that He who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into His presence. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So in this little paragraph, Paul is again, he's talking about why does he do it? Why does he speak? Why does he proclaim Jesus when it would be easier not to? And he gives a number of reasons. For this morning, I just want to focus on one, the one that comes out in the very last verse, verse 15. He says, all of this ministry, all of this speaking is for you. That is, Corinthians, his fellow believers in Corinth. It's for your sake so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So grace just means God's undeserved kindness, his unmerited favor. So how does Paul envision that grace extending to more and more people? Well, certainly uh, it would include non-Christians hearing the gospel and becoming Christians. That's probably the main thing that he's thinking about here. But at the same time, based on everything else he said, based on the fact that this is for your sake, Christian, I think we can add to that the following, that grace also extends to Christians as we hear the message of Jesus. So God's grace spreads, it extends to more and more people, that kicks up more and more thanksgiving, and the result is God is glorified. His majesty is adored and appreciated. And Paul says that's why he preaches. So how does this help us in spiritual renewal? Well, I was just, uh, just reminded yesterday of how important it is for uh, fathers to express their love for their kids with words. Uh, fathers have a lot of ways that they're supposed to express love, right? We provide, we give good things to our children, but this conversation yesterday reminded me that those things are important and vital, but they can't replace the loving words of a dad to his kids. Words like, I love you. And those are the kind of words that you just can't hear too many times as a child. Think about how preaching facilitates God's 
fatherly pronouncement of love over us week in and week out. That, that is grace extending and spreading so that God might be glorified. So when we gather, think about what's happening in terms of verse 15. The church gathers, that is the family of God, the adopted sons and daughters of God get together. God's word is opened and it's proclaimed in such a way that God's love for his children, it resounds over them again. Brothers and sisters, we need that. That is nourishment to the weary Christian, to hear once more, not just about God's grace, about the fact that God is a loving God, that he gives undeserved kindness, but God communicates his grace to us through his word as it's proclaimed. And so we are renewed as we hear that fatherly word of affection spoken over us yet again, to strengthen us, to fortify us, to give us courage and stability to go out and serve him and pursue him for the rest of the week. So we've got four characteristics of faithful preaching, and and I've tried to show how each of these shed some light on how it could be that preaching, faithful preaching, is a vital means of spiritual renewal. And as I look around this room and think about who's here, most of you belong to this church. Others of you belong to other churches. What that means, to put it simply, is that you're going to hear a lot of sermons in 2024. If you're in church on January 7th, you're probably going to be in church a lot of Sundays this year. So you and I are going to hear sermons. We are going to sit under preaching. The challenge, the encouragement from this text is what are you looking for as you do so? As you hear the Word of God preached, what are you expecting? What are you leaning in to receive? What are you reaching for? Among all the other things that could be a part of that, 2 Corinthians 4 would say we are reaching for the renewing power of God's grace, His authority, His love, and His goodness. So let's, let's do that in the year ahead. Let's lean into the renewing power of God's Word proclaimed, lifting up Jesus so that we might be changed. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are a God who speaks, who makes yourself known, and we rejoice that you have made yourself known preeminently in the eternal person of the Son. And we praise you, Lord Jesus, that you have become one of us, so that this intelligible self-disclosure of the Father could be made even more clear, and so that we could not just hear about the Father, but be brought home to the Father through your life, your death, and your resurrection. Help us as a church to be responsive to the proclamation of your word. Left to ourselves, we are dull, we're distracted, we're blind, and so we pray for your Spirit's help so that the proclamation of the word might bear much fruit in our church. Amen.